Um, welcome, everybody. I recognize uh, some of your names because I work with you. I recognize some of your names because I've explicitly sent you emails uh, about the program. Thank you for, for showing up. And some of you, I, I look forward to uh, meeting you and learning who you are as we, as we move forward. I would, uh, I'm Stephen, as I said a, a few minutes ago, uh, I'm Stephen Hansen. I'm the Director of Graduate Studies for the Master's and Certificate Programs in Bioethics and Medical Humanities at Tulane. And I look forward to introducing you to several other uh, members of our faculty. And uh, I see at least one of our students here. So fantastic. We'll get, we'll get a chance to uh, introduce you to everybody. I do have a, uh, let's say 20 minute uh, presentation that uh, I've worked very hard on. So I'm gonna go ahead and, pr and present it. Um, so let me go ahead and get started with that. Let me share my screen and we can move forward. That is what I wanted to share. There we go. You know, I was going to start with this, but but which is just a quick, you know, thirty seconds uh, uh, blurb about Tulane. But you know, we can we can we can blurb ourselves. Here's a lovely picture of the Tulane campus. Let's go ahead and move past this um, because I would like to get to the point where we can actually talk to folks. So let's go ahead and ah, uh, we'll go ahead and skip. I'm now go on to the next one. There we are. So let's talk a little bit about who we are. This is the Master of Science program, Bioethics and Medical Humanities. And um, we are within the Biomedical Sciences program at the School of Medicine uh, at Tulane University. None of that really matters to you. It's, it's more administration for us, but that's, our, uh, that's where we are. That's our home uh, here. And that's perhaps important, at least in this respect, um, because this will tell you how to find out about us. So if you're interested at all about who we are, what we've got to offer, here's the website. Again, we, we try to make it easy, tulane.edu slash bioethics. Now uh, that, and of course that, you know, there's lots of links to lots of different things there. Learn all you want from that. I'm more than happy to, to say, hey, that's a great source of information, but so are we. Feel free at any point to contact me, S. Hansen4 at Tulane, uh, or Sophie Dofengenden, we'll introduce in a moment, um, who is our program manager and also one of our professors uh, at T. Ofengenden at Tulane. Uh, there's a lot going on at Tulane and at the School of Medicine and Bioethics, and we're right in the middle of a lot of it. And I want to, to point out just one thing, that the program in Medical Ethics and Human Values, uh, which is also uh, directly connected to our Master of Science program, was established by a grant from James A. Knight, um, and we have uh, the support of uh, a number of members of the community and sort of building this into being a really valuable and really meaningful program in medical ethics and uh, medical humanities. We are in the downtown campus. If you've seen some pictures of the uptown campus near Audubon Park, gorgeous campus. Ours is, uh, so because it's downtown, looks a little bit different. You can see our building there. It used to be the Murphy Oil Building, which is why it sort of looks like there's an M on the side of the building. If you really, really sort of look at it and really wanting it to look like an M. Um, uh, we are a short uh, trolley ride from the, the French Quarter, and we are right in the Central Business District of uh, New Orleans right next to the hospitals. So that's why we're here near connected to the, to the School of Medicine is that this is the medical center for New Orleans. So let's talk a little bit about what we have to offer as a program in bioethics and medical humanities. So look, I mean, here's the easy stuff, right? We're, we're, this is Tulane University. It's nationally ranked and recognized. And you, if you don't know that, be glad to, we'll be glad to toot our own horn a little bit about it. But this university and medical school is well recognized and we get to be a part of that because this is this is such a 
a, a, an opportunity for, for us to be able to offer to you. We're really the only master's program on the Gulf Coast that does bioethics and medical humanities. Uh, the, the, there's some folks in Galveston, if you want to go that far, and there's some folks up at Emory, uh, which isn't really the Gulf Coast. Um, but we are the program that's in this area, and we want, really want to be the program that serves the Gulf Coast area. Our master's program is a 33 credit hour program, and we are a relatively small program, which means we have a great amount of flexibility that we can work with people. And I'll probably mention this several times as we go along, but we are a program that's able to deal with you and whatever individual situations you've got to deal with because we just don't, you know, if we had a hundred students running around, there are lots of times we just wouldn't be able to handle whatever the particular concerns uh, you've got are, but we don't have that. We have the ability to direct attention directly to you and your needs. So we are tremendously flexible in how this 33 credit hour program can go. Uh, here's already a way that I can show that, right? You can take this in a two-year plan or a one-year plan. I'll talk about those as we move forward. We have an integrated dual degree program with the medical school. So if you're interested in our medical school or have already been accepted to our medical school, you can get the MD and the MS, same four years, doesn't add a single year to your time. That is partly because the medical school is uh, gracious enough to set some time aside in the first two years, the preclinical years, for coursework in our master's degree, MPH degrees, certain other you know, master's degrees, so that there are the possibility for dual degrees. So that, that means you would walk across the stage, same number of years working with the same cohort that you would if you were taking just the MD degree, but you would have both the MD and the MS in the same four years. And for anyone who's interested, we also have a faculty development option where mid-career professional students can take courses in a time frame that fits with their work so that they can build their uh, portfolio and build their abilities and build their knowledge to learn more about bioethics and medical humanities. And beginning this year, we also have the option to talk about certificates. Uh, and, uh, and so therefore I will, as we move forward, we've built three different certificate programs in clinical ethics, research ethics, and in medical humanities. And I'll get back to these in a minute, but I'm really excited about these because they really open up the opportunities for people who might not be sure they're interested in a full master's program, but are really interested in what we're doing. What are we doing? Here's how our program works. This first concept, the idea of a learning community. If you looked at who we're looking at, dual degree students, mid-career professionals, people just coming out of uh, undergraduates with their BAs or BSs in a variety of different areas, we've got people who work in a tremendous number of fields. And that's before we even get to the faculty. Our faculty are clinicians, historians, philosophers, people who work in narrative studies. We've got all kinds of different people, which means that what we've got is really a community of learning here. I get to learn from a tremendous faculty, but I also get to learn from a tremendous variety of students who have backgrounds in things that I don't have a background in. I'm a philosopher. I studied bioethics and, and uh, from a philosophical background, and I've done a variety of clinical things since then, but I'm not a clinician. I'm not a medical student. I'm not somebody who studied uh, uh, history uh, in, in the kind of depth that our historians and that you might have if you've got a BA in history and so on. So we try to build this as a community of learning. Sure, we have classes where there are people who are instructors in the classes and there are students, but we are learning from each other in this. And if we do our job right, you get a lot from us, sure, but you get a lot from each other. We built the program to be this way, even though we also want people to be able to attend from a wide variety of places. So we had the option, perhaps, in building the program to say, well, here's how you do it online. You view some videos, you, you do some online uh, uh, work across. The, uh, no, that's not how we do it. 
our program does allow you to work online basically just the way we're doing it right now. We have Zoom video conferencing of all of our coursework. So you can take the, the courses from anywhere. Um, and, and we encourage that. If this is something where you, know, you want to take our courses, but you can't be in New Orleans at the moment, great, continue to take them, right? We want this to be active though. So the video, it's, it's Zoom video conferencing. It's not watching videos. It's not taking you know, tests offline. You're interacting with people just like you would be if you're sitting in the classroom. And we have courses all throughout the year, spring, fall, and summer semesters. You'll see why when I talk about how the, 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 the courses are structured for all the different possibilities that we've got. But that basically means you can start in the summer, you can start in the fall, and if you're looking at taking one of our certificates, you can really start at any time. It's a little tricky to start in the spring if, if you are taking the master's program, so we didn't, don't tend to recommend that. But uh, we are open to a wide variety of how this can work, and if it works for you to start in the fall, we want to see you in the fall. If it works for you to start in the summer, you're welcome in the summer. And for people who are taking the master's programs in one form or another, there are some uh, merit scholarships that are available. Um, they're, not, they're not going to cover your full tuition, but are limited merit scholarships. We do have them and we're very excited about uh, the ability to be able to support uh, a number of our students, at least partially as they move. The curriculum has core coursework that all students take. There are two tracks in the program, a bioethics track and a medical humanities track, but you will all take these courses, foundations in bioethics and fundamentals of medical humanities. Regardless of which track you're in, we want you to have an understanding of both bioethics and medical humanities. Everybody studies current controversies in bioethics and everybody takes a capstone. Now our capstone is basically uh, in lieu of a thesis. We don't want you to be writing a thesis in this, pro in this program. Rather, we want you to take what you've learned here and apply it to some problem in medical ethics that you've seen, um, or to apply your understanding of how the humanities intersect with medicine to better understand what's going on in the medical world and the people that inhabit the medical world. And I'll give you examples because we're teaching our first capstone course this semester. As I said, we're a young course, uh, excuse me, a young program. And we have our first graduating class coming this semester. And their capstone projects, they actually have three of them. Uh, one of them is working on a narrative of uh, the experience of uh, being both pre-med and a medical student uh, while also being a mother. Um, we have a group of students who are doing a uh, research study on the medical school class to see how, how has education in ethics changed in the two years before the MS in bioethics started versus the two years after the MS in bioethics has come about. Um, and there is a group, uh, a small group, two, two people who are doing a art installation to talk about parallels between phrenology, studying the bumps on people's heads to decide whether or not they were criminals or good, upright, upstanding people, which yes, is just as terrible as it sounds. And yes, is something that historically we did not all that long ago. Uh, they're comparing that to what are people doing with MRI studies? And are they doing, are, have we, are we in fact building a new version of phrenology where instead of studying the bumps on people's heads, we're studying the wrinkles on people's brains and saying, ah, that is the brain of a good person or the brain of a criminal and so on. And we, you know, they're very worried that we're making some of the same mistakes we've made in the past. Um, Everybody takes these courses. So the next thing that we have is a uh, core coursework, but now we have to subdivide into the two different tracks. So people who are taking bioethics will study uh, a theory of bioethics. They'll work in the clinical ethics, they'll work in research ethics, and they'll work in the basics of how do we understand theories of ethics so we can really work out what's going on. Um, medical humanity, the medical humanities track then will look at 
how do we understand medicine from the tools that we get from other areas of the humanities, narrative history, uh, and film and literature. And if you, you know, uh, think about the capstone projects, we have two capstones in humanities and one capstone in bioethics. People really trying to say, how do we, how did we teach and how are we teaching ethics? And some other folks saying, how do we understand medicine through these tools of the humanities? So I'm really excited that we have these two different tracks because there's so much to talk about. So if you want to focus on the bioethics track, that gives you, you know, training towards especially if you're working in a healthcare setting, you can work in ethical committees, institutional IRBs, uh, or, or teaching or research. But the humanities track says you can do teaching, research, reflection, narrative writing, uh, work in fine arts. Um, and these two different ways of looking at what I would say are similar problems are really critical. Uh, and, and I'm so glad that we have the two different tracks to look at. this. So those are the core courses. We also have electives, and here's a list of some of the ones that we have so far. Um, there's more that we've, there's even more than I have listed here that we've already offered, and there's going to be more as we move forward, um, especially with our collaboration with the School of Public Health, where they're teaching courses in health equity and in social determinants of health and social justice, which are absolutely acceptable uh, as, in fact, that's why we have the collaboration with them, so that we can have these as electives that are possible for our students and that their students can take some things that, that we're teaching as well. So here's a list and there's so much more to come. Now back to those certificates. What if you're saying, I really like what I'm hearing, but I'm not sure I'm ready for a full master's program. Well, what if I, what if I wanna dip my toe in? There are three different ways for you to dip your toe in. You can get a certificate in any of clinical ethics, research ethics, or medical humanities. And the certificates are four courses, 12 credit hours, and can be completed in as little as two semesters. Clinical ethics is what it sounds like. You will study some basics in uh, bioethics and focus on what does uh, what, what does clinical ethics look like and how do people actually do interactions with patients with specific ethical needs and how do we work with them? And that will include studying clinical ethics and, and also the study of our, our clinical ethics program includes uh, rounding in hospitals, shadowing with people and, and studying uh, clinical ethics face-to-face. Uh, Research ethics certificate will uh, do much the same as the clinical ethics program, but instead of focusing on clinical ethics, you'll study what are the specific ethics of doing research, uh, and they're quite different, so it's, it's worth separating those two out. And of course, the certificate in medical humanities is going to give you a chance to dip your toe into narrative, history of medicine, arts, uh, literature and film, uh, and medicine. And all of these are four courses, 12 credits. So you can dip your toe in if you want. But what if you dip your toe in and you decide you want more? Well, we got you covered. Because if you take one of our certificates, you can add to that. If you want, if you take a certificate and say, I want to take another certificate, you absolutely can. Uh, you can take a certificate in clinical ethics or research ethics, since they're so similar, you can't take both of those. But if you could take one of the two of those, you could take a certificate in medical humanities. You go, wow, that was really exciting. Is there anything more? Yes, there is. Because you can stack these and just take three more courses to complete the full master's. So if you wanted to dip your toe in and see if you liked it via a certificate, all of that credit would apply directly if you decided, yep, really love it. And I want to go on to get the master's program, uh, the full master's program. That's how you would stack a certificate. What if you said, nope, love this, and I want to go straight into it? This is a version of what it would look like. It's, this is pretty accurate, actually, because this is generally what the, the years will look like. But sometimes people will take courses in the summer semester that will make things a little bit different. But this is what it looks like. You'll mix taking electives and core courses through uh, two years and two semesters if you're taking this in a two-year plan. So you'll have three courses a semester up until the last semester in which you can take three courses or you can take only two if you wish. Uh, and you'll complete the capstone project in that spring semester of your second year. 
If you are looking at the dual degree program, uh, this is a little bit more precise because we have to work with what the medical school uh, has uh, available. So you would start in the summer prior to your first year of, of med school and you would take a couple of electives and foundations of bioethics. That way you don't have to stress out very much in your first semester. You only take one course other than the, uh, your medical school courses, which is you know, plenty in that first semester. And by the time you're sort of getting the, the hang of how medical school works, then you can take a couple of courses per semester, um, in the second semester of your first year and the first semester of your second year. And then we'll fit in a few more electives in the summer in between those two. By the time you get to second semester of second year, you've got a lot of things to be preparing for, clinicals, uh, major exams. So we only have the capstone project in that semester. And all of that is for people taking this in two years. Well, I said we had a one-year plan. Here's how this would work. Again, you'd start in the summer. Looks a lot like what the, the, the MDMS students would be doing. And then in the fall and the spring, we'll just take a few more courses. Um, so instead of taking three courses a semester, you take four courses. And we can make this work so that you can graduate in one year. So what if you're looking at, I don't want to take two years, but I want a gap year in between graduating and going to medical school or graduating and going, I didn't do that on purpose, or graduating and going to law school or another professional uh, career. Um, here is a way to take one gap year and get a full master's degree in bioethics and medical humanities. And you can focus either in bioethics or medical humanities in either the two-year plan or the one-year plan. Well, as my computer was trying to, 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 to move to, uh, what do we do with this? Right. After you complete this degree, what do you do? I mean, wh what do you do is maybe missing the, the, the key question. What will you have? You'll have knowledge and skills in ethics, medical ethics, medical humanities, professionalism and humanism. And there's teaching, research, scholarship, service that can be done with this. It also includes you can look for and you would you would have be able to pursue an advanced degree in medicine, law, social work, public health or humanities. And we will have prepared you very well for that as well. But we like to think of it as this is a way that you advance your career. We're not so much a terminal degree that says, here is the one job that you're set up for. Rather, we are a program that enables you to do what you want to do, but do it better. We think about it as, you know, whenever you have a job description, there's always that, love, that one bit that says other duties as assigned. Well, this is how you take control of the other duties as assigned part of your job description is yeah, you're the person who is trained in medical ethics. You're the person who they're gonna to come to for clinical questions. You're the person who they're gonna to come to to ask, how does this make sense? Can you make sense out of this medical case? And you might wear very well have the ability to do that through looking at the story that surrounds it or looking at the history that preceded it. So that's what you can do with this degree. Same basic idea if you're doing dual degree, you'll be well suited to be teaching or doing academic research in bioethics and medical humanities. You can work on ethics committees, IRBs, and you can do policy development. So that's what the program is all about. Why Tulane? Well, because Tulane is, well, Tulane. I mean, this is a top tier faculty here. This is competitive with any faculty in any master's program anywhere. I'm amazed that I get to be a part of this group and I get to learn from these people. Um, and the students at Tulane are, well, Tulane students, right? Same thing. I'm amazed that I get to learn from our students. These people are amazing. Um, and they're aiming to be leaders in thought and direction in their careers. And, and so will you be. Right? So why Tulane, if there are other places where you might study bioethics? Well, because this is a place where you will be in this community of future leaders in ethics and humanities. And you'll be able to take this and move into any career that you end up in with the ability to better question and examine everything. And I think maybe I have a particular bent towards this because of my background in philosophy, but I, one of the goals of our program is, is, I think, one of the goals of philosophy, to question the underlying assumptions of, of what we're doing, 
And that's one of the things that we do in many of our courses is we really say, you know, what do we, what, what do people assume is true when we ask these questions? And is it in fact true? Does it stand up to analysis? And I know the idea of questioning, questioning everything kind of as a nihilistic tinge these days makes you think of your uncle on Facebook saying, do your own research. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking, you know, especially with do your own research means just, you know, look at my Facebook page. Um, rather, we know, because this is what we do, that by questioning things, you can get answers and the right answer and know why it is right. And that's what we're aiming for. And that's what we want you to be able to do as well. And it's also worth noting that Tulane is in New Orleans. Yes, New Orleans hospitals have national reputations and so you will have access immediately to uh, absolute uh, uh, top quality clinical experiences. But you'll also be in a place that knows what it's like to deal with healthcare inequity, sometimes well, sometimes poorly. When the, when the problems in a calamity are not evenly distributed, right? We saw this in, you know, this is the, you know, this is the water line in one of the buildings, you know, down the block from us, uh, from Katrina. Um, but we also saw it in, in COVID treatment and COVID vaccine distributions. And now more than ever is a critical time for us to be talking about healthcare inequities. And, and New Orleans has seen this and we've fought against it, not always well and not always successfully, but New Orleans is at the forefront of the challenges that we've got to face in healthcare ethics today. And this is our goal. We, we, don't, we don't want this to be a program where we teach students and go home. We don't want this to be a program where you show up in class and, and listen to something for an hour or two uh, and, and maybe write it down later on and go home. No, 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 no. We want this to be at the center of making people's lives and patients' lives better by really taking on the problems of healthcare. I want us to be, we want to be, but I, I'll just make it personal. I want us to be at the center of change in how American healthcare takes care of its patients. And New Orleans is absolutely a crucial place for that to happen. Of course, it's also, you know, let's not forget, New Orleans is also uh, New Orleans, excuse me. So it's also a beautiful place to be. So as you are already here, you know this, but New Orleans is a beautiful and wonderful city and it is full of a bunch of amazing things. Yes, it's full of, uh, especially in certain areas in the French Quarter, it's full of people having a wonderful time uh, in various versions of that sentence. Uh, but it is also a place where, well, so I'm just, just yesterday, my uh, aunt and uncle, who I'm not a young man myself, who are in their 80s, uh, were, were traveling through and said, can we stop and, and say hi to you? And where should we stop? I said, well, would you like to get beignets? They said, what's a beignet? Oh, so we met at Cafe du Monde and they had beignets for the first time in their lives. And I think... If it's if if you're 80 and you haven't had a bang yet yet, we got to get on that, right? So this is a beautiful city, and it's a wonderful place to live and to be in school. So that's it. That's us. That's the master and si master of science in bioethics and medical humanities. Well, you know what? Hang on. That's the master of science and graduate certificates in bioethics and medical humanities, and that's what I want to show you is how excited I am about this and what, how hopefully maybe give you the same kind of excitement so that you will perhaps be interested yourself in the master's program or graduate certificates of bioethics and humanities. So let me stop my share and uh, cancel this as well, there we go. And then hopefully, um, be able to answer questions from you, but not just me. Let me introduce a few other folks who uh, would also be able to answer some questions. So I said, hi, I'm, I'm Stephen, I'm the Director of Graduate Studies, and I sort of mentioned uh, off, offhand that my training is in bioethics and philosophy, and I do bioethics and clinical ethics and work in social justice uh, areas. 
Um, let me introduce folks. I'll just go from left to right on my screen. So, Sophie Tofengenden, will you uh, say hi real quick? Sure, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, we are very, very happy that you joined us, all of you. So you have the opportunity to get to know a bit about our program. So I am the program manager and also faculty in the program. Um, I will be happy to help you with every question about our program, about courses, about registration, about anything that you want to know about, uh, about us. And so if you have also any questions that you want after this session, feel free to email me or Dr. Ray Hanson. Um, so about my background, I, my background is in, in philosophy and neuroscience. Uh, my PhD is from Tübingen University in Germany, and my focus was on neurophilosophy and neuroethics. So for example, I teach a course on neuroethics. Um, just a few, just an idea that you have what it means. So we talk about what is the source or the origin of um, typical, um, our moral behavior. We talked about what are the underlying mechanisms in our brain for moral behavior. We talked about, for example, um, empathy and the, the ability to feel moral, um, moral feelings, addictions, and other issues. So this is about me. If you have any questions, feel free to send an email. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm just sort of going where it looks on mine. So next on the list, I have Valerie Holiday. Hi, everyone. It's really good to see everyone here. I'm delighted that you're interested in our program, or at least finding out a little bit more about it. Um, my name is Valerie Holiday, and um, I am on the humanities side of the house, although I have been known to teach some philosophy. Um, I uh, have a master's degree uh, in philosophy from LSU and a <clears throat> PhD in English literature. So my background, my intellectual background is really 20th century America. That's sort of what I focused on um, in my dissertation, but that included the X-Files, um, let's see, Don DeLillo's novel. I, I'm one of those um, cultural studies junkies. Uh, I happen to think that the intellectual developments after World War II are staggering. And that's where I've spent most of my time, um, feminism, queer theory. Um, Marxism goes back a little bit further, but um, that's kind of my interest. And then bioethics, of course, is also a post-World War II intellectual development. <laughs> I teach, um, currently I, I made my way from philosophy and English lit over to the Tulane program uh, by teaching biomedical ethics to nursing students at Baton Rouge Community College. And also, I also teach at Delgado Community College. Um, so my, my background is in the community college system. And when I discovered that this program was interested in being flexible in a way that I hadn't heard any four-year or graduate programs talk about, I was very excited about it because it's, I think it's a new 21st century way of teaching uh, where you actually, you know, engage with the students at a, in a way that's not um, business oriented or, you know, sort of the, you know, moving people into gen ed and out. Um, so we are, I pride myself, I, I, I hope I am as flexible as I can be uh, with, my, with my students. Um, as they pursue their goals, because things just don't happen on a, a linear uh, projection. Um, sometimes people need a little bit of a little bit of uh, flexibility. So I just want to show you all. This is um, Ella is going to be a little surprised, I think, to see this again. But Ella Maroney is one of our graduating students this semester, and I asked Ella when we were at. Uh, we were doing a table outside of the Laverne Burnick Center at, on the Tulane Uptown campus. And I said, Ella, you were talking about some books in a class that, you know, I I'm looking for some new books for the doc as author class. So Ella wrote this card front and back with all of these, it it's a bibliography. And I echo uh, Stephen's comment about learning from our students and each other. Stephen is also in one of my classes right now. Uh, just to learn what we're doing. 
So we're very collaborative. There's there. I would I would like to think that the hierarchy of intellect is not as present in our program, and I would like to shout it from the rooftops. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, and thank you for letting me say a little bit. I almost want I almost wanted to to go straight to Ella at this point because she's not. You know what? You're next on my list. Let's just do it. Ella, would you introduce yourself? All right, sure. Um, I'm surprised you still have the index card, but um, yeah, I'm Ella Marone. I'm getting uh, my master's here in the program. I'm on the bioethics track, um, be finishing up this May, which is very exciting. Um, just a bit of my background. I got my uh, bachelor's of science in biochemistry um, up in Minnesota. And then at the same time, I had triple minored in English philosophy and like an interdisciplinary kind of pre-health program, very similar to this uh, master's and certificate program. Um, so I came from kind of a science background, but always really wanted to investigate these further questions around ethics, around humanities, storytelling, stuff like that. Um, so if you guys have any questions about the student experience, uh, moving to New Orleans, living in New Orleans, that sort of thing. Um, more than happy to uh, answer your guys' questions. Um, I also run the social media for our program, so I'll put those handles in the chat as well as my email if you guys have any further questions. But very glad to see such a good turnout. Um, this is an awesome program. Thank you. Um, David, you are next. Yeah, you are muted at the moment. There we go. My name is David Dukas, and I am the James A. Knight Chair of Humanities and Ethics and Medicine. I was brought here in late 2017 to create the program in medical ethics and human values. So over the next two years, went into the design phase for this Master of Science program that I am extraordinarily happy and proud of Dr. Hansen in terms of his directorship of right now. Um, my background is I am a physician uh, in the background of family medicine. I did a postdoctoral fellowship in bioethics at the Kennedy Institute at Georgetown University and then served there for a few years before an academic career at a variety of places, including the University of Michigan and University of Pennsylvania. Um, my interests uh, intellectually in bioethics are in areas of end of life care, uh, clinical ethics, expertise, professionalism, and virtue ethics. And I teach the course in clinical ethics. My other full time job is over at the VA Medical Center, where I'm also the ethics officer, not only for the New Orleans VA, but also uh, the clinical ethics liaison for all eight facilities from Florida to Texas to Missouri. Thank you. Please feel hey, free hey. to contact me at david.dukas, D-O-U-K-A-S, at Tulane.edu. Thank you. Uh, and, and Nathan. Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. It's good to see all of you here. I'm Nate Stout. Um, so I'm a faculty member in the program. My background is also in philosophy. Um, so my, my research interests are, are fairly broad, uh, have a background in moral, moral theory, and moral psychology specifically, especially having to do with issues of uh, moral agency and, and autonomy. Um, I teach a number of courses in the program. So I, I'm currently teaching the ethical theory course. Um, as well as a course in conspiracy theories in medicine, which is, has been a lot of fun. I'm actually, in a, about an hour, I'm gonna meet with students in that class and they're going to uh, present an assignment on a, a create your own conspiracy theory assignment. So I'm really excited to see what they come up with today. Um, but uh, I'm also I've also taught courses in pandemic ethics, philosophy of medicine, um, foundations in bioethics. I've taught uh, quite a few things uh, in our, our young program. Um, so I'm really hoping I get to see some of you in class in the coming year, teaching research ethics in the fall. Um, I also spend half of my time as a medical ethicist at the New Orleans VA hospital, and I am uh, Dr. Dukas's second in command in that uh, or for those eight regional facilities when it comes to ethics. So uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here, everyone, and hopefully get to work with some of you soon. 
Thank you. Um, and, and now I would love to, to have questions uh, from anybody. And, and as, as uh, Dr. Holliday has noted, um, she has uh, a class to get to. She, she's going to be teaching current controversies in 20 minutes. So especially if anybody has any questions uh, for her uh, or, or maybe directed at, at the, but let's, let's jump to those first. Uh, Liam, go right ahead. Hi, so uh, I am a student who just got accepted into the medical program, the MD program. And I'm really considering um, a career in social justice overall, but I'm not sure if the MS in bioethics or the MPH would be a better fit for me. Could you guys maybe elaborate on that? So if you're looking at, you know what, does anyone else want to jump in? I mean, I'll, I'll start and then maybe folks can, can jump in. If you're looking at specifically social justice issues, where we focus on that is, um, you know, how do you understand it, and what does it mean to be taught? You know, what is in fact just? I'll give you an example: the policy that was followed in distribution of COVID vaccines and, and COVID treatments uh, was developed uh, based on a, among other things, uh, recommendations from a, a, a group who said, well, we better focus on producing the best results with the same, with the, with the resources that we've got, paying no attention whatsoever to who that actually benefits. Let's just get, you know, if, if you're hearing utilitarianism out of this, yes, that's exactly what they were doing. Um, and so one of the things that, that we've done, and I've actually, you know, said something about it, and you can actually find a, a, a link to it on our website, is I, I think that is wrong. I think that's fundamentally a mistake uh, because it doesn't distribute, it distributes resources. Yes, but it distributes resources in a way that benefits the people who were best off going into the pandemic, right? So the questions we'll ask are, is that the right way to think about it? And I think MPH uh, programs will ask questions of what happens when you do things, right? So they'll ask more practical questions uh, and empirical questions uh, about how do you do something? Uh, and we'll ask questions about what is the right thing to do? So which one do you prefer is, is the answer to that question. One thing I'll add on to Stephen's comments too is um, you can actually have the best of both worlds because we have constructed mm -hmm. a memorandum of understanding so that you can learn these normative issues of what is right and wrong? How do you make those kinds of normative decisions? But then you can also take courses in the School of Public Health using the same construct of the tuition that you'd be paying for the master's program. Yeah. And they would count as they would count as as electives in our in our program. Um, it, you know, so a course in health equity or something like that would absolutely count as as an elective in our program. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I would add that I think the so we focus on social justice in relation to medicine. And in fact, our next two guest speakers are going to talk about related issue. So one of them is about the pain of medical inequity, and another one is about incarcerated individuals in Louisiana. So I think that we deal with a lot of these topics in different courses. So definitely this is uh, one of our main topics that are dealt in our courses, in our teaching, in our guest speakers, so yeah. And you should be getting, uh, if, you, if you're not already getting uh, emails from us about our guest speakers, uh, which you would, you know, you could easily attend them just like this, right? Most of our guest speakers are done through Zoom. Um, if you're not getting them, you you soon will be because we've got your email now. Uh, but uh, we, are, we want you to, to you know, attend these and see what's interesting. Yeah, that's a, those are excellent points, right? You can. Yeah, and I will send you all of you uh, emails about our next uh, guest speakers. The next one is actually next week. It's about the disparity in medicine, which I think will be very very interesting. Yeah. So I will be happy to send all of you a link to our uh, Zoom session that will be next Tuesday. And that program was actually partly put together by one of our students as well. So yeah. Um, so, uh, Daniel has been uh, has had his hand raised patiently. I don't want to miss you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Do you hear me okay? Sure do. Okay. Um, I had a couple of questions. My first one was, do you have uh, kind of 
climate change as a topic within your curriculum, especially in New Orleans, where it's going to be an increasingly imminent issue. Um, is there have students or even has it been built into the the coursework in any way um, engaging that topic? Nate should probably answer that. Yeah, so I, I've got an, uh, an environmental ethics uh, elective developed. Um, so far, uh, so our elective offerings are in, in some ways dependent on what students are most interested in taking. Um, so we haven't actually offered it yet, but uh, we also offer courses as independent studies as well. So that would be something that um, if that class isn't, you know, isn't currently being offered, it's one that you could talk to me about. I'd be happy to teach as a, as an independent study for students who are interested. Um, but yeah, it, that, that class certainly deals with issues relating to climate change. Um, and I haven't looked even, or, or Dr. Dukas, you can um, confirm or disconfirm this, but I think School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine likely has some set of courses um, that deal with those issues. I, I don't know if they have them currently, but I know that they have, and uh, Dr. Leviste and I have discussed our mutual interest in this. So that's a very strong possibility. And again, if you're part of our program, you can take things in the School of Public Health. But you know what? I will um, make a note to myself right now. I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can't find out. There's a couple of courses that that might have that as a, as a feature uh, in them. Um, but I will also see if I can find anything out. And if I find something, I will uh, drop you an email. Thank you. Um, would it be all right if I ask my second question as well? Thank Feel you. Free. <laughs> um, th this is a, a, a more kind of logistical question, I guess. And I understand that every person's career path and journey is very idiosyncratic and a lot of variability. But in general, would you say it is better to pursue this MS track um, earlier in one's career, say before they start medical school or as you described in the first two years, or is it better to do later or even um, kind of mid-professional stages? See that you are you are right. That is an interesting question, and you're also right. It's idiosyncratic. Um, I will say that that what a lot of people experience is it is hard to go back to school um, once you get into the. Um, once you get into the swing of uh, working and then perhaps family issues and then perhaps, you know, uh, where, where, you know, building your, your, your household and so on. Um, we definitely have people coming back in mid career. So it's totally doable, but it, it, it does make sense in my head to say education earlier is generally easier. Um, bearing in mind that that's wildly qualified on everybody's idiosyncratic uh, needs. Um, anybody else have a thought on that? That's a great question. Yeah, if, or go ahead, Dr. Stout, if you would. After you, Ellen. Okay, yeah, so I started this program like straight out of undergrad, like during finals week of my undergrad spring semester. Um, and for me, I really liked it because it is so flexible that if you're trying to pursue, you know, law school, medical school, something like that, and going through the application process, it's a good way to stay engaged academically while still going through all that application. And if you need, um, you know, adjusting the number of courses you take each semester to reflect like your other demands, whether that be a job or um, interviews or studying for the LSAT, MCAT, GRE, that sort of thing. Um, so I think it's a really good kind of step along the way, um, early career, but that's, you know, my experience. I'm sort of biased in that regard. Uh, like you said, it's extremely idiosyncratic. Yeah, no need to apologize for being biased by your own experience. We all are, but I hear what you're saying. Nate, sorry, I interrupted you or almost interrupted. No, 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 I, I, I was, uh, I mean, I agree with what's been said so far. I, I was just gonna say, I think doing a program like this is very doable uh, later in your career, uh, but it's much less doable in a one or two year block later in your career, right? So um, if you're, you know, if you go to med school and you, be, you know, you're, you become a physician, 
you're gonna have a really hard time taking four classes in a fall semester while you're treating patients, right? Um, whereas if you did that in a gap year between undergrad and med school, say, I'm not sure what your particular situation is, um, uh, your likelihood of finishing the program in a shorter amount of time, I think is much better. The other thing too, is that if you're in a circumstance where you're uh, going to be applying to a professional school, if you're not doing the dual oh. degree where it's integrated into it, it actually can also help burnish your GPA and uh, letters of recommendation and to be frank, your critical thinking skills to prepare you for medical school. So if you're about to go to medical school, that's your anticipated path or to law school, social work, whatever, doing this as a one or two year program, whichever is your want, can be uh, excellent preparation, but can also really enhance your application when it actually is going to be sent to that professional school. So glad I have everyone here, right? These are all great points that I didn't think of them. Um, any, uh, is anyone else or did that answer your question? Does anyone have uh, additional Yes, thank questions? you very much. Anything else we can answer for anyone? Oh, yes. Yeah, Alexandra. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could touch a little bit more on um, like some of your favorite capstone projects that have come through the program. Oh, I am muted. Okay. So we are a young program. Uh, so I actually have, have already described all three of the capstone projects that we've had. But in a prior uh, uh, at a prior university where people have done a similar kind of capstone, we kind of designed it in, in much the same way, uh, the capstone project. Um, let me think. So there was one where, and the, these are frequently done by groups. So it's not an individual, it's groups with different skills and different talent sets, uh, bringing their different, their, their different skills together. One uh, fairly large group actually saw that there were a lot of patients who were un- represented. That is, they were incapable of making their own decisions, but either because they were John Doe or Jane Doe's, or just because nobody was there who could make decisions for them, uh, no relatives could be found, um, they also didn't have anybody else to make decisions for them. And there is a legal process for what you do. You get a court order guardian for that, but there were a number of problems, not least of which being there were a lot more patients than there were guardians. And the courts were backed up by months. Um, so they said, this is a problem. Now, obviously we can't magically make uh, the courts clear, you know, cl cl clear the paths or anything like this. So what can we do? And they, try, they addressed this by trying to find alternative methods to locate guardians. And uh, rather than make this a, a paper that they wrote up and sort of said, here's a hypothetical, part of the project was, all right, now we're gonna go talk to uh, they did talk to the legislature, although that, that's, that's always kind of a who knows what's going to happen when you do that. But they talked to the judges that would be the ones that were being called by the hospital saying, we've got somebody. Can you get an emergency guardian? And the judges who would say, not, no, uh, because we don't have any, we don't have any, but and yes, I can get you somebody, but it'll take six weeks. Uh, they had a different alternative uh, in, involved in that. That's one of the ones that I found very exciting. Um, another one similar to that uh, group found, thought that there was perhaps inadequate informed consent for some of the tests done on pregnant women. Frequently, the, there are blood tests done to uh, assess the genetic structure of the fetus, um, and the, the tests might be done simply on, we need to draw your blood. And you're at the OBGYN, you've been there, you know, every, every month or every couple of weeks for a long time. Yeah, whatever, you draw the blood, whatever you did. And that's not informed consent. Um, so they thought maybe we can try to uh, make um, educational materials that are available in OBGYN's offices uh, that are also pitched at the level of, you know, anybody can, can pick these up and read them and figure out what's going on. And then they'll know what kinds of questions to ask uh, at that point. And they did, you know, they made, they made videos, they made pamphlets, they made, you know, a variety of different ways. Um, 
those are the kinds of things that, that stick out. In my, and now there's three or four more jumping in, but whatever. Those are the kinds of things that stick out in my mind as, as things that, that have been done. And I think the sorts of things that people will be doing again. Thank you, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Yeah, they were, they were pretty impressive. It was great to be the capstone director and still is great to be the capstone director because people do these amazing things and I just get to let them go and maybe occasionally push stuff, push problems out of the way. We are, we are at time if folks, if no one else has, has questions that they want to ask, uh, they want to, oh, Harshita. Hi, I am also an incoming medical student and you mentioned the flexibility of the program, but it looked like one of the starting dates was in the summer. I was just wondering if medical students kind of had that same flexibility for when they could start the program. Um, so let me answer that in two ways. Uh, the first way is, yeah, yeah, we'll work with, we'll work with you however you need to be worked with. The reason that medical students we have starting in the summer before is that that way you get done in the first two years. Um, so if you want to be done in the first two years and you are completely done with the master's uh, going into your clinical years, then there's, a not, it's, there's not a lot of flexibility there. But um, there is, Stephen, in that she can take it remotely. So you don't have to oh, be yeah. in New Orleans. Hey, you don't have to be here. You could be in Timbuktu or Australia and be able to be a fully live video conferencing interactive student in the courses. Absolutely. Um, so that that's why we do it that way. Um, that being said, there are at least two of our uh, MD, MS students who are not doing it that way. They've had various different ways of, of working. One took a gap year, one um, did, Let's just let's just simplify it as is not doing it that way, uh, and we're still going to get them through too. But I suspect that for the the second person, we're going to have she's going to have to take a course or two in her clinical years, and uh, for the person in the gap year, obviously she took a gap year, so that's a different way of, of doing it as well. Uh, we work with the thing. The thing that makes us flexible is that you know we can work with you on whatever your specific needs are, uh, rather than. Oh, we have 17 different ways that we've already thought of to, to resolve your issues. You know, you tell me what it is that you want to do, and we'll see what we can do to make it happen. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure thing. Anyone else? And like we said, by all means, you know, contact me. S. Hansen 4 at Tulane uh, or, or T. Ofengenden at Tulane, contact Sophie. Um, we, and by the way, you don't have to remember that. Just go to tulane.edu slash bioethics. We're, we're right there and you can contact us that way too. Um, I'd be glad to answer questions that way as well. Thank you all so much for attending. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people and I uh, hope to, to, to hear from you again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, y'all.